Hello and welcome to week 3, part 4 of VGM 703, Synthetic Aperture Radar. In this lesson, we'll introduce the principles of Synthetic Aperture Radar, which is how we create radar images of Earth's surface from space. In the previous lesson, we showed how side-looking radars receive signals from objects at different slant ranges, which means that we can effectively create one line of an image. Now, we'll show how we construct the rest of the image bit by bit. Here we have our radar image with the range and azimuth shown like this. We have our sensor flying at a height r and moving at a speed v in this direction and it's creating a beam shown by the gray outline here. When the satellite gets the return from the ground here we'll see a signal from the house because it falls within the beam that has been sent out from this location. And the width of this signal, of course, is going to be determined by the range resolution. As the satellite moves along, it will continue getting return from the house because the house is still within the beam, even though the satellite isn't yet at the house azimuth location. And we can see how this will continue. The satellite will continue to measure return from the house until the house is no longer in the satellite's beam. The number of lines in the image where we see a return from an object is related to the azimuth resolution of the sensor. And as you might have guessed, this is effectively the beam width of our sensor on the ground. So how do we calculate the beam width? It turns out that the beam width, or the azimuth resolution, is related to the length of our antenna, L, and the distance to our target, R. It also depends on the wavelength of the signal being sent out. Using approximate values for the ERS satellite of 10 meters for L, 850 kilometers or so for R, and 5 centimeters for lambda, we have a ground beam width of approximately 5 kilometers. If we want to improve our azimuth resolution then, we either need to decrease the wavelength, which is not something that we really want to do, or we need to increase the antenna size. For example, using the same R and lambda values, to get an azimuth resolution of about 10 meters, we would need to have an antenna that is 5 kilometers long. Hopefully it's clear to you why this is not actually a workable solution to our problem, so we're going to need to think of something else. So let's have another look at how we build our radar image in the azimuth direction. At this location here, our signal doesn't actually return uh, a signal from the house. That is, the house isn't within the beam. At this location, though, it is. This is the first point where we see a return from the house. And we get another return here, and here, and so on, until we get to here, where the house is no longer within the beam. So remember that at each of these different points, the satellite is going to return record signals that scatter from directly beneath it, but also from earlier locations at different, um, at different ground range uh, distances. Because the platform is moving relative to the ground, these returns are going to be Doppler shifted. Their frequencies are going to change for the same reason that the sound of the ambulance siren changes as it is driving toward or away from you. If, this, if the return is scattered from an area behind the platform, or sorry, ahead of the platform, the frequency will be shifted higher, and if the return is scattered from an area behind the platform, the frequency will be shifted lower. So if we process the returns based on the Doppler shift, then we can effectively treat all of these different returns as if they were received by one large antenna. We're creating a synthetic antenna that's much larger than the actual antenna that we have. It turns out that if we do this, the azimuth resolution of our sensor ends up being half of the length of the antenna, that is the physical antenna. It doesn't actually matter how far away the target is, our ability to distinguish between targets in the azimuth direction is only limited by the physical size of the antenna. And as you might imagine from my voice, this is really great news. Just like we saw with range resolution, by processing the signals in a clever way, we end up improving the resolution of our system without, have, without having to change that much about the physical details of our system. Unfortunately, 
when the signal measures all of these different returns, the resulting image looks like noise. We have lots of different overlapping returns that interfere with each other in a mostly random way. So, as with many things in life, if we want to try to make sense of it, we have to focus. In this case, we have two different steps. The first one is one we've seen before, range compression, where we correlate or convolve the measured signal with the signal that we sent out over the range direction of the image. The second is very similar, known as azimuth compression. Here, we're correcting the Doppler shifts in the azimuth direction. Because we typically end up with a higher azimuth resolution than range resolution, the image is going to be stretched out in the azimuth direction. So we can also use a technique called multi-looking, where we effectively average together a given number of azimuth pixels in order to end up with an approximately square image. So here, I've used the Python SAR processing tutorial from EO College, which is linked here and also at the end of the presentation, and that provides a nice demonstration of how all of this works. Starting from our raw, unfocused image, we first have to range compress the image, which results in something that looked like this. In this image, we see a number of different pixel patterns that look like they've been smeared out in the azimuth direction. So think back to the first slide from this lesson where the house showed up in multiple different lines because of the width of the beam on the ground. If we azimuth compress the image, we end up with something that looks a bit more like what we expect. We can see that this is some kind of ground image, though it looks like it's been stretched out in the azimuth direction, again, owing to the different resolutions of the sensor in the azimuth and the range directions. So as a final step, we can average over every five pixels or so in the azimuth direction, again, depending on the relative resolutions of the azimuth and the range, in order to get an image that looks a bit more like what we might be expecting with pixels that are approximately square. Unfortunately, even after we've gone through all of these different steps, we're still going to have distortions into the, in the image owing to the fact that the radar is side-looking. The first kind of distortion that we'll discuss is known as foreshortening, and the diagram here shows how this happens. We have our satellite up here, a small mountain on the ground, the satellite beam in blue, and the slant range shown in red here. And remember that the wave front of the signal has a circular pattern, at least in two dimensions. So point A is going to be seen at slant range distance A prime, point B is going to be at slant range distance B prime, C at C prime. And we can see here that the distance A prime to B prime in slant range is significantly shorter than the distance AB on the ground. Because of the slope of this mountain, between A and B, and the direction that it's facing. It turns out that A and B are at fairly similar distances to the sensor, even if they have different distances on the ground. We also tend to see bright pixel values associated with these slopes because they're actually facing the sensor. They reflect a lot of energy directly back to the sensor. The next kind of distortion that we'll talk about is layover, shown here. So layover is an extreme version of foreshortening where we see A prime actually being recorded at a distance further away from the sensor than B prime. So the top of the mountain is effectively laying on top of the bottom of the mountain. And this happens because in the, in, in the satellite's look direction, the mountain is actually closer to the sensor than the bottom. Like with foreshortening, we see bright pixel values associated with this type of distortion, and again, for the same reason. The, uh, the slope here is a very good reflector back to the sensor. Finally, we have shadow, where the back slope is entirely hidden from the sensor by the top of the mountain. With this type of distortion, we have dark pixel values, because nothing actually returns to the sensor from the slope BC, or between points C and D. Once our image has been focused, it's still in radar geometry. That is to say that the pixel locations correspond to the range distance and the azimuth distance rather than the actual location on the ground. If we want to compare the image to other remote sensing data, 
or use it in a GIS software, then we have to geo-reference or geocode the image. When we download a SAR image, like for example the one that we use in this week's practical, it has information about the satellite's location that we can use to do this, though we usually also want to have a DEM to help correct the different distortions that we've discussed. This process works similarly to the orthorectification of optical images that we've seen in previous modules. We're basically trying to take each pixel and map it to its correct location on the Earth's surface, as if we were seeing it on a map. So we see an example of this here, courtesy of the Alaska Satellite Facility, using data from the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency. The first image, the before, shows what the image looks like when the pixels correspond to range and azimuth distance rather than ground location. And the second image shows what this looks like when we have mapped them to the correct locations. So we can see here that the slopes that are facing the sensor are bright because the satellite is flying in kind of this north, southeast to northwest direction here looking towards the right. We can also see dark areas here in the northeast part of the image where the steep canyon walls create shadows that are not actually seen by the sensor. Remember that the slopes facing the sensor are bright because they're efficiently reflecting energy back towards the sensor. Slopes that are facing away from the sensor will appear dark because they're reflecting energy in a direction away from the sensor. So if we want to study the actual properties of the ground using the backscatter recorded by the sensor, we often need to correct for this effect, which is a process known as radiometric terrain correction. And we can see an example of the result of this here, again courtesy of the Alaska Satellite Facility, using data from the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency. The first image, the before, shows how slopes facing the sensor are bright, because again, the satellite is flying in this kind of southeast to northwest direction, looking towards the right. In the radiometrically corrected image, we can see how many of these bright slopes appear darker, and some of the north-facing slopes appear brighter, but not all of them. And the reason for this is that some of these slopes appear brighter than the others because of an actual difference in backscatter values. The south-facing slopes that we see in this area are primarily covered by deciduous trees such as birch, while the north-facing slopes are primarily covered by conifer species such as black spruce. And we see this difference again in the radiometrically corrected image that we don't necessarily see in the original image. One thing that you'll notice with SAR images is that they often look very noisy. That is, they have this kind of salt and pepper or speckle pattern in which we can see in the example image from earlier. Although this looks like noise, it's actually an interference pattern. So remember, the SAR sensor is recording both the amplitude and the phase of the signal that is returned. Remember also that the phase of an individual pixel is going to be the sum of all of the different sub-pixel scattering surfaces. This speckle pattern varies randomly over time, but if we want to average a number of scenes together, the measured backscatter that we get will approximate the actual normalized radar cross-section of the pixel, assuming that the scenes remain coherent. And next week, again, we'll see a few different examples of how we can actually use this speckle pattern to track the motion of surfaces over time. So in this lesson, we've discussed how the azimuth resolution of a real aperture radar image is restricted by the antenna size, which means that creating a real aperture radar image from space is pretty much impossible. The solution, as it often is, is to fake it until you make it. In this case, we simulate having a very large antenna, a synthetic aperture, which helps us to get around this limitation. With this and other and the clever signal processing techniques that we had introduced in the previous lesson, we can get high resolution radar images from space. Unfortunately, SAR images have a number of distortions that we need to correct if we want to be able to use them. And we'll see how some of this works in this week's practical on SAR image processing. You can read more about the topics that we've discussed here in the textbooks, Lilith Sand, Kiefer, and Chipman, Chapter 6.4, or Campbell and Wynn, Chapter 7.
I've included another link to RadarTutorial.eu, which has a good overview of synthetic aperture radar. This 2013 article is a great tutorial on SAR, synthetic aperture radar, which covers the different steps and concepts in a bit more detail than what we've gone into in this lecture. These two articles here from NASA provide a good overview of SAR and different sensors, as well as a discussion of how we use SAR images to study other worlds, such as Saturn's moon Titan. And finally, this video by Adrian Schubert is a funny but excellent explanation of how synthetic aperture radar works. I, remember, I recommend giving it a watch if you have some time. That's all for this lesson. I hope you found it interesting, and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email me or post in the discussion forum on Blackboard. Bye!